dedicate their lives to helping orphaned animals. They open their hearts and homes to all the challenges of raising a young life, no matter how large or small. They are the Wildlife Nannies. Today on Wildlife Nannies, a visit to a kangaroo colony in the deep Australian bush. So we'll have a look at her foot, it's here. Nanny Gabby has taken care of orphaned kangaroos for over 30 years. Charlie, her youngest kangaroo, needs to be introduced to the rugged wilderness and learn to cope on his own. But will he find his way in the darkness? And volunteers Suzanne and Laura have had a long time dream of helping animals. At the Doktari farm in South Africa, these two nannies are now taking care of antelopes, mice and chipmunks. It's a 24-7 service for orphaned animals, and saying goodbye is always hard. Dawn at the Long Grass Nature Refuge in the Australian bush. Many orphaned animals, both past and present, appear at the breakfast table of Nanny Gabby Freeb. Come on, Jack. It's time for breakfast. Gabby is up very early each day and doles out food to all the wild kangaroos. Gabby fell in love with these Australian marsupials over 30 years ago and has been taking care of them ever since. I had a friend who was a wildlife ranger and he had a joey that um, the mother had been killed and asked me to take it to town to someone to look after that knew what they were doing. And when I drove into Darwin, I was living in Darwin then, um, the woman said, oh, you should look after it. And I said, no, no, I don't know what to do. I'll, I'll hurt it, you know. Anyway, she convinced me that I needed to because she couldn't. And that's where it started. I was 19 then. And now I'm 51 and I still love kangaroos. In the wild, kangaroos have to face all sorts of threats sickness, dog attacks, and even car accidents. This is the home of the kangaroo colony, the Long Grass Nature Refuge in Gatton, Australia. Ten-month-old orphan Charlie loves his pouch made out of a soft towel. He's Gabby's little favorite, and also the youngest inhabitant at Long Grass. For the past few days, He's been given daily free time outdoors as part of his wilderness rehabilitation. He's getting used to freedom outside, spending time with the other kangaroos in the bush. <laughs> come on, breakfast. Essen. Kelly, come on, Kelly. Come with me, Matilda. It's not an easy job to raise a baby kangaroo right, because without their mother's pouch, these creatures can't survive. So the embryo develops in the pouch. So instead of the kitten, for example, it's born with, you know, with hair and, um, you know, it's nearly ready almost. These guys are just like a tiny little idea of a kangaroo or a wallaby. And so they need a long time to grow and develop and, you know, to be with their mother. So it's hard being kangaroo mother because you start from, the, from nothing and then you have them and quite often the, the mothers have a, a young at foot, a little bit like her size. She wouldn't be in the pouch anymore but she'd still be drinking from the mother and they also have a little baby in the pouch. Stubby. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Gabby's Refuge is also the gathering point for other kangaroo preservationists. Hello. Hello. How are you? 
How are you? Fine. One is her neighbor, Desley, who's fighting for the life of little Ebony. Nanny Suzanne and Laura are volunteers at the Doctari Wildlife Orphanage in South Africa. This giant 700 hectare refuge is home to all sorts of animals. Ian Merrifield and his wife Michelle founded this animal ranch. This is a little diker. Her name is Priscilla. So part of your duties will be to look after her and to feed her. She needs to be fed regularly. And she's a bit difficult. Sometimes she doesn't like the bottle and you have to establish a relationship with her. This is only a temporary home for the volunteers from Germany. They've been working here in Hootspruit, South Africa for four weeks now. I think it's very important to realize that all parts of nature and the environment interlock. And if you destroy one part, you are destroying several parts above it. And people who do not understand that do not look after animals. While Ian is making his rounds, Laura's checking up on one of her little orphans of the past few weeks. This is Theo. He's a chipmunk that we found about two weeks ago. He probably fell off a roof or something like that, and we've been trying to nurse him back to health for a bit before we release him back into the wild. At his young age, Theo would not be on his own in the wild yet. He's too little and inexperienced. He can't even forage for food on his own. After four weeks at the Doctari Ranch, Suzanne knows exactly what Theo's favorite meal is, baby gruel with bananas. So that Theo will learn proper chipmunk behavior, Laura will introduce him to his own kind today. How will he react? Oh, she's so beautiful. Like, we'll have a look at her foot today and see how the little toe is. Yeah, no. And we we'll might just weigh and measure her again and see okay. how she's going and right. if the milk's doing what it should do. Yep. She's so beautiful. Look at all the hair. Oh, I she's growing. Yeah. Hello, Des. Hello. Yeah, how are you? <laughs> how are you? Mm -hmm. You're a little red. <laughs> She's yeah, yeah. Come on, I'll make a cup of coffee. You can take it out. Desley's orphan, Ebony, was found by a friend in the pouch of a dead kangaroo. Since then, raising the little one has turned into a 24-hour job. Even the nights are occupied with feedings. Eric, my boyfriend, found her driving to work. So she was in the middle of, mum was in the middle of the road dead. So, but still warm, so she was, she had a good start because she was still warm, she wasn't icy cold. So, but she was thrown out of the pouch? Uh, no, she wasn't, she was still in the pouch, but she, she must have had her feet up out of the pouch because she lost one of her toenails. It's a fever. Eric is now going back to the spot where he found Ebony. This is about where I found her. She's lying on the road. Obviously, she'd probably been dead about an hour or so. Uh, not that long, because she's still the body was still um, uh, soft and, and warm. Um, so I, as soon as I got out of the car, I could see the pouch moving, right? And uh, so I knew she had a baby. But what I did, I went back to the car, got a pair of scissors, right? I had to cut the teat off and put a bobby pin through the end of the teat. The reason we do that is so that she can't swallow the teat into her. Because as a baby, as a baby joey, what happens is that they, they go on the teat and they stay on there until they get big enough to release the teat. So they're always on the teat. Um, that way, put the, we to cut, had to cut the teat, put the pin through the teat, then I put her in a pouch and I took her back home and um, left her with Desley and I had to go back to work then. It's difficult to raise young kangaroos and that's why Desley always likes to ask for advice from her specialist neighbor. Gabby has good tips on feeding. The most important thing is to keep Ebony well-fed so she'll keep growing. Is she hungry? 
Oh! I just can't believe how every day she's so, she changes so much. Mm. Beautiful. Just a couple of little mouthfuls. I'm happy for her. I'm happy she's going to be free. In the meantime, Peter is on his daily rounds at the farm, checking for foxes and other kangaroo predators. Mammals, mice, all that sort of thing are, are killed in the, in the thousands by foxes and small wallabies and kangaroos as well. So if we were to let foxes and dogs get out of hand here, we would be wasting our time trying to rehabilitate kangaroos. After the check, Peter and Gabby are off on another important chore of the day for their kangaroos. Laura and Suzanne are in charge of taking care of the baby antelope at the ranch. This is Priscilla. Although Suzanne's been getting Priscilla back at her feet for the last few days, she also has another baby antelope named Emily that has just been admitted. Well, Emily is blind and she's therefore not as curious as Priscilla. She's a really stubborn one though. I need to have a lot of patience with her because she's very fidgety and often very active when one tries to feed her. The blind baby antelope was left behind by its parents and wandered through the bush all alone. She came to the park injured and from what can be pieced together, she suffered quite an ordeal. She was attacked by baboons. It's why she's got such a large wound here on her head. It's healing nicely, though. But she's also got a broken leg. She was found by passers-by. They saw the attack and managed to save her from the baboons. Since the attack, she's already grown quite a bit and has gotten used to her bottle as well. So far, Emily and Priscilla were raised in separate areas. And that's because these shy creatures are usually loners. But now, Laura and Suzanne want to bring them together. Two baby mice named Rippy and Tanny are also under Suzanne and Laura's care. They've been with Suzanne since birth. And it's quite the challenge to keep these two little customers under control. Um, this is Rippy and Tanny. I've really enjoyed taking care of them. <laughs> They're barely two weeks old. And we're going to release them back into the wild very soon. These nannies will soon be returning to Germany. So, their orphans have to be reintroduced into the wild before they go. Suzanne's biggest challenge is getting these two used to the wilderness so that they can take care of themselves. For now, Rippy and Tanny receive the same food as Laura's little chipmunk, baby food out of the syringe. Suzanne knows her babies well. This one is quite active. Rippy is really lazy and sleepy all the time, so he's a little fatter. It's time for a little outing. Feeding time works just as well with these little guys outside. I'll be so sad when I leave. I'd love to take them home with me. I've gotten used to them. I mean, they are really quite funny and amusing. Will Rippy and Tanny be able to cope in the wild? Gabby and her friend Peter are arriving at one of their nearby meadows. They've planted grasses here suitable for feeding kangaroos. Peter is a software designer and shares Gabby's passion for these marsupials. Living space of the kangaroos has become smaller and smaller due to new houses and streets, but droughts are an even bigger danger for the kangaroo. 
Fresh grasses are very important for the small and sick animals at the reserve, and Gabby does her best to provide only the best for her little orphans. This is kangaroo Daver. He's in quarantine right now because he's torn his leg on some barbed wire fencing. Even though he's offered fresh food, Daver likes grains better. Once a week, Gabby weighs all her kangaroos. Today, it's Charlie's turn. Her smallest foundling is slowly getting too big for his pouch. This is evident by his weight. Charlie has gained quite a bit, and Gabby is very pleased about that. Last week, he weighed 16 pounds. This week, he's gained 1.5 pounds. That's a little much. I've got to make sure that he doesn't get too fat now. That's important. It's okay, Cody. Charlie now weighs 11.5 pounds. From now, you'll only get three bottles per day, not four anymore. And you need more exercise outside. Remember that, Charlie. Time for a siesta. And Charlie wants to get back into his cozy bedroom. He feels safe here, that's all. I make him spend more and more time outside. So right now, he can spend a few hours here at home. It's nice for him. I mean, he's still so small. He just likes to be in his mom's pouch once in a while. Today, Gabby is also worried about Candy, who's been sick for a while now. This is the um, droppings from Candy. And she was having problems and um, she got Candida. Now that the growth has shrunk, her feces look quite normal and we just want to check that she hasn't got Candida anymore. Peter has set up a lab with a microscope and special computer software. This way, fungi, parasites, and other microbe sicknesses can be analyzed to help determine what's wrong with any of the kangaroos. We have a look at that. Almost in the center, there's a little rod with three dots in it. Mm -hmm. And that's the yeast. So it looks like she needs to be treated for worms and she still has a slight in candida infection so we need to do something about that as well. Will Gabby be able to breathe easier soon or will Candy's condition worsen? Chipmunk Wendy is having a great time out in the wilderness with a friend. You, Nanny Laura now wants to introduce Theo, one of her babies, to Wendy. Theo was abandoned by his mother. He feels content with his adoptive mother, Laura, but will soon have to say goodbye to her. This is the early morning scratch. He likes to cuddle and let himself be scratched. I'll sit with him on the meadow and see how he likes the surroundings and how he will react to them. He's got to get used to new noises and surroundings so that in two or three weeks, we can release him into the wild. Laura is slowly getting her baby used to a new world of colors, smells, and noises. This is all new for him right now. He's observing everything, and then he comes back again as if to say, Mommy, are you still there? Curiosity takes second place whenever hunger calls. Theo goes right to his mommy's side. Although he's not yet capable of finding food on his own, Theo's becoming more and more courageous every day with a little help from Laura. Of course I get attached to these little guys and it's amazing when they come back to you, but it's also nice to see them free. Theo still has to learn a few things before he can survive in the wild. And finding a mate would not be a bad thing either.
Today, Laura is introducing him to Wendy. She seems very curious at the sight of another chipmunk. But is this real squirrel love? Will these two head into the wild together? Gabby can now breathe easier. Peter's tests show that Candy's infection has finally cleared up. I think she's tired now. Hopefully we'll see how she is tomorrow. We'll have to wait until tomorrow to see how she does. I don't think it's serious, but we'll see. It's dusk at the reservation, and two male kangaroos are fighting for the lead role in the herd. When I first started here, I always counted the kangaroo herd during feeding times. And if one of them wasn't there anymore, I used to get really worried. I then wondered what could have happened. It totally upset me. Now I'm just happy if they come, and at least I can see that some of them are healthy and that everything is well. It's a big step to release the kangaroos back into the wild. And Gabby still is not used to goodbyes. When former babies return to Gabby with their own young in the pouch, it's a big comfort to her. It becomes a wonderful reunion and is a sign that Gabby and Peter's work is worthwhile. Tonight, Gabby's worried about her smallest baby, Charlie. The little explorer never comes home this late. He always returns before it gets too dark. Normally, I call for him at dusk, but now it's really getting very late and he gets scared in the dark. I'll have to go out and see if I can find him. Will Gabby be able to find her smallest baby in the dark of the night? Suzanne has decided that her adoptive mice are ready to make their own way in the big wide world. It's time. We're going to let you go free. Isn't that right? Yes. Where's Tanny? Ah, there you are. Come on. But Rippy and Tanny don't seem terribly interested in these new surroundings. Suzanne is trying very hard, but these two just don't want to head out into the wilderness yet. I think they're just too used to people and can't imagine life on their own out there. They are maybe still a bit scared. It's probably too early and they are too young and timid. I guess we'll just have to keep them for another week or two. They'll just have to stay a little longer. And so, it's a grace period for Rippy and Tanny. Maybe these two don't want to give up the around-the-clock nanny service just yet. Meanwhile, things are going a lot better with the antelopes. This introduction seems to be working out. You can clearly see that Priscilla is very eager to meet Amelie. She wants her to come over. It's so nice to see these two together, and that they like one another. It's a good sign. Sharing a milk snack is very soothing for these two, and it gives them a chance to get used to one another. The first meeting is going really smoothly. They're curious about each other, they're checking each other out, cleaning each other. It's all really good. It's an important step, because in the morning, Suzanne and Laura will have to say goodbye to their little orphans. Both volunteers are returning to Germany. You can tell that they've gotten used to each other a bit. They've become quite tender with each other. They're licking each other and smelling each other. It's really a great first meeting. 
Laura and Suzanne could not have wished for a more beautiful going away present for their babies. Looks like a happy ending for Priscilla and Emily. Gabby's nerves are stretched to the limit. She still hasn't found Charlie and knows that a whole night out in the darkness is too much for her little baby. If she stays out all night, she'll get sick because she'll get very stressed and... Oh, good grief. Ah, there you are. Hey, Charlie. Oh, you were so scared, weren't you, poor little Charlie? See, look, here's a nice bed for you. Good girl. You did that well. And so, an exhausting day comes to an end for Gabby Freeb and Charlie. It looks like he really missed his pouch. Charlie is more independent than Gabby thought. He's actually quite all right in the wilderness, even if he does enjoy sleeping indoors at night. And so, it's finally time to say good night at Long Grass Nature Refuge. Next time on Wildlife Manny's, Manfred and his wife Helen do everything with their wombats. And baby wombat Brady has an exciting day ahead of him. He's off to kindergarten for the first time. And three wolf pups meet their new parents Tristan and Jesco for the first time. But will this introduction to new 